Well, God bless you. Hello, family. This is Pastor, and once again, it's good to be with you on another Wednesday evening as we study in God's Word. Of course, this is August the 26th of 2020, and we are grateful. It is always a privilege and an honor for us to gather together and assemble ourselves and we just pray that God would bless each and every aspect of this Bible study. I pray that it will minister to you as God will speak through me to you. So we're going to be getting right into the word. And we're going to have a word of prayer and ask God to bless. Father, we are grateful. We are very thankful. I pray as Father God uh, with those who even this evening might be facing some inclement weather and, and storms and hurricanes. As part of this nation, we ask, Lord, that you shelter them and be with them. We are also very grateful, Father God, for your divine covering and protection for each of us. Now, as we study your word, we ask that you would bless, speak through me, and minister to your people in a very special way. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We want to talk to you tonight from the subject, Stir Up the Gift. We've been talking about the anointing and how powerful the anointing is, and we have access to the anointing. And we want to be sure that, that having access to such a special gift that comes with the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, that we want to stir up that gift. So now some scriptures that we will be reading, well, first scripture will be 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. Acts, chapter 8, verse 18 through 20. Acts, chapter 8, verse 18 through 20. John, chapter 14, verse 16. John chapter 14, verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 through 28. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. And Matthew chapter 6. We would like to look at verses 6 through 7 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 through 7. And let's begin as we start up with 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Again, we'd like to title this lesson, Stir Up the Gift. Now, Timothy says something. He says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of the hands. We have something very special, and we don't want to neglect it. We don't want to uh, allow it to just uh, fade out or fan out. And when you think of the word stir up in references, what he's saying is, Rekindle the embers, fan the flame, keep the fire burning. And if you've ever been out or you had a, a, a fire camp or an old wooden fire stove or oven or something like that, we was raised with those things. Sometimes, you know, if you ever barbecue, you, you, you notice sometimes you have to stir up the charcoal, you have to stir up the ember, embers. All right, and that's what he's telling us. He said, don't let, the, don't let the flame go out. Fan the flame, blow on it, put air to it. Keep it going. So we have to stir up the gift of God. We got to keep things burning. Now, it is a gift of God. And just a reminder, look what it says. When we, we keep the embers going and we fan the flame, look what, what, what happens. It, it, it helps us, especially during this time. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, uh, timidity, being a coward, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, calm and well-balanced mind, discipline, and self-control. So there's so much going on in the world, 
And the reason we need the anointing of God upon our lives, we need to make sure that we keep things burning and keep things, keep the right type of atmosphere for that anointing to abide upon us, is because we have to realize that what we've been given is not the spirit of fear. And there's fears running rampant now, especially during this pandemic. Fear is out there. So as we stir up the gift of God, it helps us and it gives us the reassurance that we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. All right. So remember, we are to stir up this gift. Now, if it's a gift, you remember, it cannot be purchased or it cannot be bought. And Peter reminded the sorcerer Simon, and I like to read that verse again in Acts chapter 8, because this man, this sorcerer, saw that having this gift was something special. It was very powerful. Having the precious Holy Spirit and the anointing upon our lives was very powerful. And it says in Acts 8, verse 18, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So Simon noticed that laying of hands, that you could receive this precious Holy Ghost can be transferred. And he wanted this Holy Spirit. He wanted the power. But look what Paul said to him in chapter 8, verse 20 of Acts. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So we're very grateful that the, 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 this precious gift of the Holy Spirit, the anointing, the awesome privilege of abiding in the presence of God cannot be purchased. But we are required to rekindle the embers, fan the flame, keep it burning. And a lot of times you realize that, you know, one of the things we have to be careful of is because I know we're not fellowshipping and we're not gathering, but it's up to us individually to to make sure that we keep the fire burning because I know a lot of times it's very beneficial for a church as we do gather and we fellowship together. That's very because we help each other. We, but, but I know the enemy, cause can't you see the strategy of the enemy? They try to let the flame go out, let the embers go out. And if you're not careful, you know, you can see that your passion and your desire for the things of God can slowly begin to fade and to begin to, to, to decrease. And you don't want that to happen. you got to keep the embers going and fan the flames and keep that fire burning. Can you say amen? Now, John chapter 14 tells us, verse 16, he said, I will pray to the Father and he shall give you another comforter, says the Lord, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Wow, what a precious promise. So God has chosen something. And this is awesome. God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, has chosen to be with us, to dwell in us, to reside with us. That's an awesome privilege, family. That's an awesome, awesome privilege. The God of the universe, the God who created heaven and earth, has chosen to abide with us and to be within us. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says something, too, that you have to understand. He has chosen to dwell with us. And look how we are described. And I love the way Apostle Paul describes us. As, our, as containers, as, as vessels. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure, the precious abiding presence of the Holy Spirit residing in us, giving us access to God's presence and God's anointing. 
We, we, we have this. Isn't that wonderful? God on purpose chose to dwell in earthen vessels. This body can house and, and become a, res, a residence for the precious Holy Spirit to abide in. That is an awesome privilege. And when you even look at the life of Jesus, you see that Jesus came to this earth. He didn't have some type of celestial body. No, it, the Bible says that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So God himself became flesh. God himself, in the form of Jesus, resided in this human vessel, this earthen vessel that, that Paul calls it. So the reason he does that is because he doesn't want the power. He says that he, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So the power that we receive and the power that we experience is not on our behalf, but it's because of God who has chosen us and how precious that he is. He has chosen us to be able to, to, to house his precious Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit can reside within us, that the Holy Spirit can anoint us and empower us to operate on a whole nother level. How special that is. And to God be the glory. So we're earthen vessels, right? We're human beings. We're flesh and blood. But we have the awesome privilege of housing. That We have the awesome privilege of allowing the precious Holy Spirit to reside within us. And we thank God for it. You know, we're frail and we have problems. We have, we have issues and, and, and we're, we're not perfect vessels. But nonetheless, God has chosen us. It kind of reminds me of, of the story where there was two water pots. And there was an old tribesman who, who put the two water pots on a stick. And he would carry them day by day to a watering hole. He would fill them up and, and take the watering pots. And he would travel to the water hole. And he would travel some distance back to the tribe. And he did this day in and day out, day in and day out, traveling back and forth. But, you know, as the story goes, every time they arrived back home, the water pot on the, on the, on the left side was always somewhat uh, not pleased because he, he never returned with a full pot of water. So every time, every time they arrived home, the water pot that had the crack or the leak would simply not feel totally fulfilled because it always returned back home with less water. And it complained to the owner. And it requested to the owner, why don't you repair me? Uh, why don't you repair me so that I too can return uh, with a full pot of water like my, my friend here? Uh, and the next day, the owner asked the pot, as he travels, I want you to do me a favor. As we travel to the water hole, uh, I just want you to, 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 to look at something. And as we travel back, I want you to look at something also. So as they travel to the water hole, the, the, the owner, the head tribesman said, look, look, look down. What do you see? They, they, they didn't see anything. He didn't see anything. He didn't notice anything. You know, because they were going toward the water hole. But on the way back, the head tribesman asked the crack little water pot vessel. He said, now, as he had the water in the pot, he was coming back. And, of course, the crack pot was not feeling very happy because he was leaking. But the tribesman asked him, look underneath you. What do you see? And he saw rows and rows of beautiful daisies and beautiful wildflowers that were blossoming and blooming. He said, now look on the other side with the full water pot. What do you see on the, underneath him? There was nothing but just dirt. There was nothing there but just sand and, 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 and just rocks and so forth. But on his side, it was just plenty. Just as far as the eye could see, all the way back toward uh, the tribe, toward home to the village 
there was nothing but beautiful, beautiful rows of wild daisies and all kinds of wildflowers. And the Crite water pot then realized that because of the leak that he was concerned about, all of these days and all each and every day and all the trips that he made back and forth, the tribesmen on purpose did not fix the leak or the crack because he was watering the daisies as he walked and as he went day in and day out. So even though the pot did not feel fulfilled, it now realized that the crack, that the leak it had, was, was fulfilling a greater purpose. It was fulfilling something very, very special that only the owner knew about. Amen. So you realize that that the the crack pot was, was was necessary. The farmer knew exactly what he was doing. And aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that God loves to use crack pots? God takes us exactly the way we are. He uses us. He, he made us. It is he who has made us. He knows exactly what we need and exactly how to use us. So understand something. That water pot, that little water pot with the leak, with the crack, thought as though its life was not fulfilling and that it was not uh, reaching its full potential. All the while, the owner knew that as he traveled back and forth every day to the watering hole, that he was watering the flowers and daisies even as he returned back to the village. So to God be the glory. We, we realize there's some things that we may ask God to do or ask God to change about us or ask God to fix. Remember Apostle Paul? He had something. We don't know exactly what it was. The Bible refers to it as a thorn in the flesh. And he prayed thrice or three times to God to remove that thorn. Take it away, Father. But God's only response to him was that my grace is sufficient. So we realize that God may not fix everything. He may not change everything that we request of him. But he knows exactly what he's doing. And he has chosen chosen us to be these earthen vessels. We house the treasure of God. We house the precious Holy Spirit. We can't afford to let the Holy Spirit just be idle. The Holy Spirit needs to be actively participating in our lives. And we need to make sure that we are able to access the awesome power of God. So God loves crack pots, if you don't mind me saying so. And we see that, that on purpose, God chooses certain people that whom the world would simply reject. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 through 28, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. On purpose, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So God on purpose chooses people that and that you know that the world might overlook. And look at what it says in the second part of, of verse 27. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. He's an awesome God. All through scriptures we see how God uses different things and, and how God delivers its people all kind of ways. Uh, he used a stick with Moses. He, he delivered David with Goliath that, uh, with a, a stone. God guided that stone and, 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 and orchestrated things on, on behalf of David. So we just see how God uses simple things. And here it is for the most precious, precious gift that he can give us. And that is, of course, his son, but after his son ascended on high and Jesus is now on the right hand of God the Father, he now has given us the precious Holy Spirit to reside within us. So God, on purpose, chooses the foolish things of this world 
and on purpose chooses the weak things, right, so that people can know for them. No other reason. If I think, look at verse 28. And the base things of the world, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28, and the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And the purpose of it is clarified in verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. So whatever we accomplish, whatever we're able to do or perform, whatever we receive from God is because God has chosen us to be carriers of his precious anointing, to be carriers of the precious Holy Spirit. You often heard pastors say this one time, uh, that we as Christians, we're the only, only religion that has the privilege of carrying our God with us. Isn't that awesome? We transport God with us. He is in us. That anointing abides within us. God's presence, his power can be upon us. So think about this. We have the awesome privilege of being chosen by God. We're not the smartest. We're not the brightest. We're not the, the, the most prettiest or, or handsome, whatever. But yet God chooses us to anoint us, to dwell within us with his precious Holy Spirit. But he wants us to realize that no flesh can glory in his presence. All of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the majesty and power belongs to God. But it is an awesome privilege for us to realize, wow, that we have access to the precious Holy Spirit, which gives us an opportunity an uh, opportunity to experience the awesome presence and the burning, removing, yoke destroying power of God. We don't have to be the most, the strongest, because with God upon us, He can anoint us, and we can receive strength that is supernatural, like Samson. There's no. No record of Samson being recorded as being some bodybuilder or big guy. We just know that the Spirit will come upon him and he will receive strength, mighty strength, awesome strength. So we don't have to be some big bodybuilder or whatever. The presence of God and the anointing of God can come upon us and give us that which we don't have in the natural. So we need to do just what Paul is telling us in 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 6. He said, I want to put thee in remembrance that by stir up the gift of God, stir things up, family. Don't allow this time of social distancing allow you to grow cold and, 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 and allow you to lose interest in the things of God. You got to fan the flames. You got to keep it burning. Rekindle the embers. Now, how do you stir things up, Pastor? How do you get things going? I'm glad you asked the question. Psalms 1 verse 1 says this. One of the ways that we can definitely keep and fan the flames of stirring things up in our lives is by meditating on the Word of God. And I'm quite sure you've heard Pastor say this time and time again. We can meditate the Word of God. And it's important not just to read the Word of God, but to meditate and to study God's Word. Let that Word infiltrate your very being. Let it permeate your, our, our hearts. So we are to not just read, but to meditate, to study, to, to speak the Word and, and allow that Word to become a part of us. So Psalms 1 verse 1 says this. This is a way that you can stir things up. Blessed is the man that, first of all, walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, listen to this, does he meditate day and night? Keep it stirred up. Oh, the love. You ought to thank God for the honor and privilege to be able to to, to fellowship with him and to, to, to be in his word daily and to, to, to meditate on that word. Oh, you'll keep things stirred up. When you do that, you'll keep the fire burning. You'll rekindle all the embers. You won't let the coals go out and, and, and the flame. You, you'll keep fanning the flames of passion and love and desire as you study God's word. It shouldn't be. Uh, uh, some type of, of jury obligation. It should be an honor and a privilege that you get to meditate and study God's words. There are people across the world who have to have underground church, who have to hide the Bibles. We have an awesome privilege of having access to the word in so many different forms and translations, yet we seem to neglect it. But how do you stir things up, Pastor? How do you keep the flame going? You keep it going by meditating on God's law or his word both day and night. And look what will happen as a, as a byproduct of doing that. Psalms 1 and 3 says, and, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Isn't that awesome? Just by meditating on God's word, just by studying God's word, and making God's word a part of it, you are fanning the flames. You are, you are keeping the fire burning. But even as a result, you will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You, in other words, a tree that's planted by the water is not contingent or it's not dependent upon what the weather does. It's right next to a water source. So whether it's dry today or raining today, it doesn't matter to the tree that's planted next to the rivers of water because the rivers of water becomes its source. It is its source. It is its supply. Isn't that powerful? So... As we meditate on God's word, meditate on his, his laws and all of his precepts and commandments, oh, my Lord, we do that day and night and allow his word, hallelujah, to become part of us. We are fanning the flames. We are stirring up that gift of God. And, and, and we realize that we are feeding the precious Holy Spirit and our spirit and his spirit are feeding upon God's word. We're, we're getting stronger. And just a, as a byproduct, uh, hallelujah, we will bring forth fruit in his season. And whatever we do is going to prosper. Oh, my Lord, isn't that a beautiful, wonderful promise? Whatever we do, whatever he does or she who is meditating and fanning the flames and keeping things stirred up will prosper. Now, the other thing you need to do is this. Not only should you meditate on God's word and study God's word, but the, another way that we keep things stirred up is through a special kind of prayer. I want to call this a closet prayer. Yeah. Not only do we meditate God's word, read and study it and let it become a part of us, but we also, in order to stir things up, we have to have closet prayer time, personal prayer time, private prayer time. We have to have that. If you go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, you see there in verse 6 through 7, Jesus is teaching about prayer. And this is very powerful. But thou, when thy prayers is to enter into thy closet. So where you pray is very important. Now, he's not saying that you have to always specifically have uh, go somewhere or, or lock yourself in somewhere. The point that Jesus is trying to make 
is that there has to be a place uh, of, of quietness. There has to be a place of, of where you can, you can privately have a chance to pray with God and to pour out your heart and to talk to him. Now, he used an example of a closet. He said, when thy prayer is enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door. Now, that's very powerful. He simply means there are so many things, family, that, that can distract us, and so many things that can, can, can just be a, a total hindrance to having that quality, private time in prayer with God. So God wants us to not just, just pray, but he wants us to be able to find time that we can steal away. There has to be a place. There has to be uh, a time where we can devote that totally to God. And this is one of the ways that we keep things third up. We're spending quality, private, personal time with God. And look what he says. He says, when you pray, enter into the closet, and when thou hast shut the door, in other words, cut the telephone off, cut the TV off, get alone and be with God. He said, he said, pray to thy father, which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. You know how to be blessed publicly? You want to know how to prosper publicly? It, have, first of all, requires that you participate in something privately. Your public display of reward and success is only a reflection of what you do in the private. Oh, Lord, you, I hope you catch that. So we're, we want to be publicly rewarded, and we want to be publicly uh, have su good success, but it's contingent upon what you do privately. And that's even in the natural sometimes. When you think about it, a lot of these famous people and athletes that you see who are accomplishing great feats and things, you watch these famous golfers and this, these, these famous basketball players. They look like they can shoot three-pointers and with ease. And, and, but you don't realize how many times and how many nights and evenings that they've been practicing with no crowd and shooting and hitting the golf ball and, and doing these things. Personal time. You have no idea how long that's been going on. And once they do come to the public, we begin to rejoice and, 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 and marvel at their gifting. Oh, but we don't realize how much time they put in private in order to, to achieve that level of success. So, so it is from a spiritual perspective. We have to stir up the, uh, up, up the gift that God has given us. Oh, pray, thank you, Lord, for this precious Holy Spirit. We don't want it things between us to 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 grow cold. We don't want the embers to start dimming. We we don't want the flame to go out. We want to have that passion and keep that fire burning. It can happen the same way in a relationship. It can happen even in a marriage, or in a home. It, we can start taking people for granted. We can take life for granted. And sometimes you have to just think outside the box and do things different because you want to always keep the fire burning. Amen. Amen. So he says, listen, when you enter into the closet and you shut the door, in other words, God says, I want to have your undivided attention and let's talk, let's share with one another. And, and when we do that in secret, God says, I'll make sure that you're rewarded in public. Oh, yes, he will. He's an awesome God. Look at verse 7. What do you talk about, Pastor, when you're with him? Talk about, just pour your heart out. Look in verse 7. He says, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So don't use vain repetitions. No, no, no. Just be open. And being that it's private and personal, you can talk to God freely from your heart. Tell him what you feel. Ask him. And, then not, and once you talk to God, sit there quietly and be quiet and be still. And allow him to speak back to you. 
Listen for his ideas. Listen for his little insights of wisdom that he will give you. So isn't this awesome, family? Uh, we've been talking about the awesome anointing of, and the power and the presence of God, which comes upon us because we have been given a special gift, and that is the gift of the precious Holy Spirit. And 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, Stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting, over hand, of, of putting on of hands. Now, I want you to realize this. That as I get ready to close, that we have to stir up the gift. We have to fan the flames. We have to keep the fire burning. And it reminds me of, of a time when I was a little kid. I can reflect back as we grew up. Uh, my mom would often make a very special little treat, a very special little beverage. And the only thing it, it required was water and sugar. Now, it came in a little package that she would tear off the top and pour into this little pitcher. And she would fill it up with water, and you would see whatever color. If it was grape, it was you know, blue. If it was red or cherry, it, it would be red. But you know what I'm talking about for those of us who are old enough. This was called, a uh, little beverage was called Kool-Aid. Now, it was something special. And mom would put ice in that thing, and that little pitcher would just be full with, with this Kool-Aid. She would pour out Kool-Aid to all the little children. We would, I could remember that just as good as it was yesterday, that that was something special. But there would be times that we would drink the Kool-Aid, and it wouldn't taste quite as sweet. It wouldn't be as sweet as normal. And we knew as kids we knew as children that we knew what the problem was the problem was not the kool-aid the problem was not that the sugar had not been added the problem was that the sugar had went down to the bottom the sugar needed to be you know you know where i'm going don't you the sugar simply needed to be stirred up and as we would stir that kool-aid that sugar would once again dissolve and mix and it would be sweet and ice cold on a hot summer day. We enjoyed it. But the point we, I want to make is that the sugar was there all the time. It was at the bottom of the pitcher, and it simply needed to be stirred up. And could that be your problem? Could that be what some Christians are experiencing? The Holy Spirit is there with them. The Holy Spirit is available. He's there. Uh, his love, his compassion, his mercy, his everything that comes with the Holy Spirit is there. Could it be, just like that Kool-Aid example, the sugar was there all the time, it was on the bottom. Could it be that the Holy Spirit is with us? All the while he's been with us, we simply need to stir things up. We need to stir up this gift by rekindling the embers, fanning the flames, keeping that passion and fire burning. Don't let this time of social distancing cause us to lose that passion. And even though we're not gathering, even though we're not meeting, we have the responsibility to make sure that we keep the passion and the fire and the flames burning. That we go after the Holy Spirit. That we, we, we stay in His Word. We meditate that Word day and night. And we find that private time to enter into that closet, as Jesus said, and shut the door and pray. And we can stir up this gift and, and, and rekindle this flame and passion that God has for us. And we can walk in and experience not only the presence, but also the awesome anointing power of God. That burden removing, yoke destroying power so stir up the gift, family, and watch God move in your life. And to God be the glory and the honor and praise for all that he has done and what God is going to do. And I just pray that he show himself mightily. So thank you for sharing with Pastor, and I appreciate this opportunity to have a time to share with you. Stir up the gift. May God bless you as I pray. In 
Jesus' name.